Uh, hi everybody, how y'all doing? Uh, it's another book review. This time we're doing something a little different. It's not just gonna be a quick five minute summary. Ash! Knock it off. It's not gonna be another uh, five minute summary of the book and a quick shot of thoughts. I wanted to go a little more in depth into this one because it was, it was something special. It deserves a good 30 minute minimum uh, long term review. I, I am of course reviewing Stones for Abigail by Onision. Now, Onision, if you are not familiar, is a rather infamous character on YouTube. He's played by a guy named Greg something. I do not watch his content myself because, quite frankly, he's a dick. And a lot of his humor is best summed up as uh, unfiltered cringe. I wish I could show you examples of this. Unfortunately, he also has a long history of abusing copyrights. So, frankly, I'm, I'm already concerned just showing the cover of this book because he's not a good person. You really only need to go back and look at his uh, controversy, one of many, in which he was reviewing preteen girls. Most honest YouTuber, my ass. And do forgive me if there's noise in the background. I have two rambunctious kittens who refuse to be quiet while I work. Ash. You make a noise. Fans of mine might recognize the uh, tabs that I'm using here in the book. Five color codes. The blue ones are marked every time the book has some sort of bad character moment. The green are for bad plot or world building. The pink are for bad lines. Uh, orange this time around are for moments of pure cringe. And the yellow is for anything else that I couldn't really classify otherwise. In, in this case, they're mostly bad writing mistakes. Typos and the like, and oh, trust me, there are a lot. Now, to be fair, I did not mark the book every single time I found something boring or annoying or anything like that. Much like the New Moon review, I tried to focus just on the moments that I thought really needed to be pointed out or would have been worth referencing later on. I didn't make a note of something if it was like a repeat of the, if you just made the same mistake outside of typos. So I could have used a lot more. Uh, I get very in depth with some of my literary analysis. Uh, not sure if you could really call this literature, but whatever. Now this is a self-published work. Pr quite, quite obviously there's like no copyright material anywhere in here. And for good reason, because I don't think any single publisher would want to touch this. It is, I'm, I'm gonna be perfectly honest. New Moon was the worst book I had ever read until about a week ago. Now it's just the worst professionally edited book I have ever uh, read. Now, despite what I said in my New Moon review, um, yeah, the, the book was edited. And frankly, the copious amounts of mistakes and typos I found in this one kind of demonstrates what No Moon could have been. But I'm not here to just shit on Inision entirely, as much fun as that would be. Um, I don't think that it's really legitimate criticism if you just go for the bad points. There are some good things about this book. They're extremely scant, but they do exist. There are a few good lines that, eh, I mean, they're not perfect, but I kind of like them. I mean, there's one where the main character just is kind of in a bad mood, so he's hanging out in his room, and he says, I welcomed the silence like a warm blanket on a cold night. Okay, that's actually good uh, writing, I think. It, it's decent imagery, it's relatable. Who doesn't love a warm blanket on a cold night? It works. Unfortunately, lines like that are very few and far between. Also, Anision, th this point kind of works for and against the book because Anision, right off the bat, says that he's drawing from personal experience. And drawing from personal experience can be an absolute uh, lifesaver for a book because it has the chance to add that much realism to whatever you're writing. There's a certain amount of life you can breathe into your characters, into your, your world, if you do in fact know what you're talking about. I mean, John Grisham's uh, legal thrillers are, are a great example of that. Unfortunately, um, Onision, while he does use a lot of personal experiences, he doesn't use them well. The book actually starts off with an author's note, 
and he says, This book is made up of events that occurred in my own life mixed with fiction from the made-up life of James. James is the main character in the book. James is essentially a better version of myself. His home, his school, and his life all resemble my own at his age. The people James analyzes and is surrounded by are not so unlike those I've known as well. This, this troubles me. Onision does not have the wherewithal to properly self-analyze, and that becomes screamingly obvious as you go through the book. If I had to sum up Stones for Abigail in as few words as possible, I would say nihilistic cringe. This is not any kind of um, happy recollection of one's high school days. I actually have a, a note for this on my computer here. The best plot synopsis I can give you for this is it's about a loser in high school who was written by a guy who was probably a loser in high school and never got over being a loser in high school. So he rewrote his high school days in this deranged fantasy in order to make himself seem both downtrodden and cool which makes everyone involved come off as a big loser. And I would know because I was also a loser in high school. The difference was, I got over it. The entire world is a simplified version of high school reconstructed by someone who hated high school. Nothing feels real, though I could believe that much of what happens in the book happened in real life. It takes away from the authenticity that the book could have had. It feels like Onision was trying to recreate his high school days. Like, it's not some sort of a cynical re-examination of it or, or anything like that. It was like, oh no, that's not how it happened. Here, this story is how badass I was. Here's a story about the time I beat up four jocks in a parking lot. An event which does happen in the book, mind you. There are also several very forced political messages shoved in here. Like, there will be... Things will be going along, and all of a sudden, hard right turn! Uh, here's why guns are bad! And it, it doesn't help anything. You can absolutely write that kind of a message into a book. Lots of people have done it before. But the way he goes about it, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. I'm, I'm just going to go through a quick plot synopsis, and by quick I mean like probably 40 minutes. Breaking down the plot and the characters and why everything in this book is awful, so you don't have to read it. Though to be fair, I do recommend reading this, but I recommend reading it in the same way that I'd recommend people watch The Room. It's just kind of fun to mock. Also, I know I'm not the first to do this one, so when you're done watching this review, go over to Strange Aeon's channel and uh, check out her review of this book because where I got the idea to do this. I'm at least fair when I blatantly rip people off. And in the off chance that Strange Anne's herself is watching this, howdy, love the glasses. So I'm not going to be going over every single point. Eventually that would get redundant. Um, but we are going to be hitting the major ones. And this laughable thing uh, pretending to be a plot. So let's go. Right off the bat, you're hit with this wall of text here. The formatting in this book is atrocious. Now, it doesn't become terribly obvious the first couple of pages because the dialogue is uh, very rare, but the, the way that this book is formatted is you've got a big wall of text. Um, there, there seems to be no linking theme or narrative between any of the paragraphs. They're just one chunk of information, it's kind of whatever the hell's going on. And uh, later on, when the dialogue does become more prevalent, it's kind of all shoved in together in one paragraph. It is very ugly to read. You gotta worry about uh, flow for the reader because you, you wanna make the reading experience comfortable. And it's more comfortable if dialogue is split up into separate lines instead of shoved into a single paragraph. If, if you have an entire conversation in one single paragraph, whole thing doesn't flow very well. Especially because the dialogue is, it's not like broken up between quotation marks so that you know you just have a conversation between two people going back and forth. Check any published book for that. The problem is every single bit of dialogue, almost, uh, starts with, and then this character said, and then that character said. Uh, my note here says, 
The sentence structure is boring and word choice is sloppy. It doesn't feel like James is supposed to be seen as some pretentious hipster, but that's exactly what it comes off as. And because of that, there's an instant disconnect between what the narrator explains and how the reader interprets him as a character. James is supposed to be this deep, misunderstood man of his age, surrounded by the, the plebeians and the nimrods of the world. And no, no, he's just an obnoxious hipster. And James is absolutely melodramatic. For example, everything in his room is painted white, to the point where not only does it come off as forced, he almost straight up admits that it's forced. Painting my room like this was a clear act of subtle, self-inflicted psychological torture. I was going through another phase, from darkness to light, and repeat seemed like the story of my life. One of the early points that really gets hammered in is James's people watching. He watches everyone around him, kind of stays in the back and observes. And I wouldn't mind that so much. You can actually make a real character off of that if you use the right words. But James constantly describes his classmates and the people around him as humans. Every once in a while, that can be fine, except it gets really weird. It's like he constantly attempts to, to call the people around him just humans. It's like, why not people? Oh, and I forgot to mention this at the, the very start. Uh, special thanks to uh, Lainey, I believe that's his wife, but I don't keep up with Onision drama, so I don't know. Anyway, it says, uh, special thanks, uh, Lainey, thank you for editing the first draft. Now, I am not the perfect writer. I am not the perfect editor. I miss things all the time. My own published book is not the best. I left a few typos in, unfortunately. Um, at, at one point in Micro God, a guy draws a gun twice without holstering it or anything. So I'm not going to go after the editor here who is not a professional. But there are all sorts of lines like this. There was only 15 minutes left in the class. If I were to give some sort of a basic English lesson on all the mistakes in the book here, we'd be here forever. That being said, I will grant James does at least have some characterization about him. It's awkward and cringy and I don't like reading it, but it is characterization. It's better than Bella Swan, who was effectively a blank slate. James at least is a person. He's just not a likable one. Anyway, James goes to a crappy little school. Apparently they get no funding. They hire the worst, most unprofessional teachers uh, that they could possibly find. And there are routine fights. As the sounds of flesh collided fist to cheek and chest quickly followed the howls from the surrounding students. They would scream, oh, as if it were sincerely delightful to witness creatures like themselves suffer and fall apart before their eyes. So why, why don't you call them people? Man, it's so weird. So James goes to art class and he shares that class with Abby, spelled with an I. We also get to meet a few other characters in the book. For some reason, we get a thing about a character named Alex. He's introduced by James recalling a time that Alex peed into a jar under his desk while in class. This information means nothing, goes nowhere, doesn't contribute a single thing to the plot, and Alex, I don't think, actually comes up again. Like, maybe he, he might come up at one point later as a victim in a crime, um, but if he does, it doesn't lead to anything. So I don't know why this is in here. Why would we need to know something as unique as the kid who peed into a jar? What does that do? I mean, I guess it sets up the school as being like the worst in the country, but unless you're going for satire, he, he routinely goes over the top in some of these complaints and descriptions. You'll see many more examples of that as I go along. Uh, we also meet Jason, the dumb jock who gets into a lot of fights and was responsible for the earlier fight. But Abby is the girl of James's dream, and she is the important figure in this scene. I wanted to inspire some acknowledgement of my existence from Abby, so I opened my mouth to greet her. 
when my fingers brushed up against the freshly smeared gum under my desk. Ew! I shouted out on impulse. It's actually kind of fun. Anisia, if you need someone to do, uh, do like an audible reading of your book, I'm your man! If you refuse to see the world around you for what it is, you're just wasting your eyes. Hello, Jaden Smith's Twitter account! All of the side characters in this book, with the exception of Abby and, and uh, Davis, which I'll talk about him later, but all these side characters exist purely to reinforce James's negative worldview. Um, his mom complains about work sucking. All the kids in this book complain about school sucking. And they work to make it worse. Uh, the teachers are assholes. The students are assholes. Everyone's an asshole of one stripe or another. Uh, of Jason, he was just another moron placed on this earth to live his life completely unexamined. A pawn that had no awareness of its own role, let alone that it was just another tiny component within a massive, unstoppably twisted game. Jesus Christ. Anyway, all the kids in the art class are paired up for a project. Uh, Abby is paired with Jason, and James is paired with Alex, the kid who peed under his, uh, under his desk. And uh, Abby doesn't like that, so she requests to specifically work with James. It's not a matter of, I don't want to work with Jason, which would be a, a perfectly understandable statement. No, she specifically points out James and says, I want to work with that guy. Keep in mind, these two don't really know each other. I, I frankly, I can't really describe the way Abby's introduced very well because it feels like it's coming from two different angles. On one hand, it feels like she's the girl in class that James has always had a crush on but never had the, the gall to work up to start a conversation with. But at the same time, she feels like the foreign exchange student who showed up the week before that James was instantly smitten with. Now, either one of those would be perfectly acceptable. Using both doesn't make any sense. Abby admits that she doesn't really know James very well, so to pick him out specifically within everyone else in the class uh, suggests that she's comfortable around him or she knows him in some degree, but there's almost no interaction beforehand and instead we're, it's actually suggested that uh, James has never talked to her before. But apparently he's just so manly and impressive and funny and cool that Abby is like instantly drawn to him. Um, there, there's a word for that. <laughs> anyway, uh, Abby is so impressed with her initial meeting with James that she slips him a, a little note and it just says, nice one. And this is actually a cryptic clue which uh, James later discovers is her phone number. And my reaction to reading that is, who does that? If either one of these characters had some sort of uh, an affinity for puzzles or, or riddles or something like that, I, that would actually be a good point. It would make them look more uh, rounded, more interested in their own uh, hobbies. But that's not what we get. This is a random code put in there for no particular reason. Why wasn't she more upfront about her art project partner? Got some next level cringe going on here. So anyway, uh, James calls out Jason, the, the jock, in another class. And uh, this of course leads to a fight. Uh, Jason beats up James and very badly and we get introduced to Matthew and then Matthew never does anything of significance for the rest of the book. I mean he dies at one point. The character introductions are terrible. I don't think a single person is brought into the story organically or for any kind of purpose. James is getting beaten up so Matthew, uh, a friend of his sister, just grabs him and pulls him away, and that's it. He doesn't talk, he doesn't like do anything else to defend him, he doesn't tell Jason to back off, he doesn't take James to the, the nurse, just 
He's the reason the fight stopped, because the plot needed it to stop. This kind of character could have been replaced by any teacher or any extraneous student, or frankly, Jason could have just gotten bored and left. That's the kind of writing we're dealing with here, folks. So anyway, because uh, James at one point pushed Jason, ignoring the fact that he got his the, the shit beaten out of him, uh, James is suspended. I mean, Jason is as well, but whatever. But while James is leaving school, he sees Abby and her boyfriend Seth in the parking lot having an argument. Uh, Abby demands that Seth leave her alone. Seth decides to go fuck himself. He gets in his car and leaves. And then James and Abby walk home. They have a, a nice little chat about how tragic both of their lives are. So James and Abby walk home and yeah, they, they start chatting and uh, Apparently it's really cute and, and James uh, decides that yes, he does really like this girl. In fact, he likes Abby so much that uh, he, he writes her an email uh, talking about how, how sad her eyes look, how, uh, how hurt she must be. Even with my brief presence in your life, I picked up on so much suffering and almost feel powerless to create any change. There are so many wounds, so many scars, so much I only know enough about to fear. I am trying to understand. Abby, you have more pain in your life than I can imagine. I hear it in your voice. I see it in your eyes and in the way you move. I just want to see you smile without there being an ocean wall of tears behind your eyes. You've known this woman for a couple of hours. I cannot speak for the women out there, but I imagine receiving an email, anything like this would be off-putting to say the least. But as a guy, this dialogue, this, this conversation Onision is having with himself is, is so one-sided and so cringy that like I said, I was kind of a loser in high school, and I want to beat this guy up. He, he has no social awareness. James has no clue how he comes across, and that actually reinforces itself in what is almost a genuine moment of, of self-introspection. When he realizes, oh shit, I must have fucked something up because Abby didn't show up to school the next day. Um, but the whole thing was actually a, a red herring because Abby wanted to see him behind the church. Because, you know, that's that's where all the cool kids hang out. And I just got to say real quick, I, I really... Th this sentence, rather this passage right here, sums up James's perception of himself so succinctly. As I approached the church, there was a strong, forceful wind blowing behind me that made it feel as if I was being pushed to her by nature itself. I felt like a fool for thinking that. I am far too unimportant for any significant force to consciously influence my life. I'm really awesome! Also, pity me! He's such a self-defeating asshole. Anyway, Abby just wanted to meet with James to say, uh, I'm not a broken project for you to try to repair. I am a strong, independent woman, and I don't need no man. Uh, no, that last part's actually not true. She very much does need a man. She needs this man, as James is the only one in school who could understand she's not broken. She's okay, I guess, even though she does complain uh, that her mother abandoned her, which forced her to live with a father who doesn't even care if she lives. Uh, keep in mind, I'm on page 40 as I'm reading this. None of this relationship is earned. Everything is rushed and the characters have no chemistry. These two are slowly, not slowly, they are quickly working towards a relationship that has not been earned. For something like this, for, for a romance to properly work, you need to build towards that. You need to have the characters actually uh, talk to each other and interact with each other and spend more than two scenes together. 
Especially if their dialogue is as badly written as this. But life moves on, and uh, James is introduced to his mother's boyfriend, a man who is so important that she's been going out with him for several months, and James has no idea who he is, and yet his mother is talking about moving the whole family to the other sides of the mountain to be with this guy. And James meets him by uh, saying, uh, so who is this gentleman? Which up to this point is so out of character for James. Uh, we, we don't see him doing anything remotely like this prior. This does lead to a, an interesting moment on the next page though. Um, an amusing line, admittedly, but it does go against everything that Onision stands for. Uh, James has a sister that he doesn't really get along with, and uh, she decides to just kind of attack him by saying, My sister interrupted, aren't you seeing that messed up emo chick, James? Looking over at my sister with a blank face, I said, aren't you seeing every guy at school, Lisa? Which I think is funny. That's a clever retort. The problem is, isn't that slut-shaming? Isn't that something that Onision is very much against? Or, I don't know, maybe he's cool with it. I can't say. His self-insert character certainly doesn't have a problem with it. So anyway, James is uh, considered for a TA position in, um, in his history class. Not sure why he's shown no significance in, in any of these classes, and all of the character, all of the teachers uh, seem to hate him. Uh, but he's, he's pulled in as a TA. Uh, for that to happen, though, uh, he would have to drop his art class, so he makes a deal with the guidance counselor, Ms. Robertson, and, uh, oh, I have a lot of talk about her later on. She warns him to not get involved with, uh, with Abby because she's bad. We're not given any detail on why Abby's bad, but you better believe she's bad. The, the reason for it is so dumb. We get more dialogue between uh, James and uh, Abby, and James comes across as a sweaty neckbeard guy who uses the term milady unironically. My face was beaming from feeling her warmth around me. I replied, you will be the one reason I look forward to Jim. I'm just gonna take a small aside here to say I really, really hate the way he presents the dialogue by always stating he said this, she said that. It's so tiring to read. But we get uh, gym class and that is where James and Abby talk a bit more and more importantly we meet Mr. Mack, the gym teacher and the only teacher in this entire school that James actually likes. And apparently Mr. Mack likes dodgeball. And despite having a little experience at dodgeball, it turns out that James is a total badass. I very quickly found out I was quite good at the game, better than I thought at least. I kind of used Abby as my motivation to do well. I imagine it was some kind of evolutionary thing, a man trying to impress his mate with physical performances to demonstrate his superiority over the other members of the tribe. Anyway, the book goes on. Uh, Abby and James decide to become a real couple, but uh, oh no, we've got the the big climactic scene where they go to school and uh, it's it's under attack by a school shooter. James rides the bus into school, and as soon as the the doors open, they hear a couple of pops and they realize what's going on. So the driver shuts the door and uh, drives away. Good move, bus driver. That's exactly what you should do. James then demands to get off the bus because Abby is still somewhere in school and her life is in danger. And the bus driver just lets him go. But James decides to roller skate uh, into the school and then stops because the floors are too sticky with blood. So he takes his, his roller skates off and charges around through the hallways uh, noticing all of the dead bodies until he finally comes across the shooter himself. It turns out it's actually Seth, Abby's ex from earlier. What does James do at this uh, pivotal moment uh, when Seth is pointing his gun at uh, one of the teachers? Well, James, of course, 
stands there and does nothing because Jason runs in and then throws Seth to the ground, disarms him, and beats the crap out of him, and literally punches Seth into a coma. James does nothing. This is important. James does nothing to help the situation or stop the shooting in any way. He does eventually find Abby and comforts her, and you know, that's all fine and good. Uh, he does nothing in the grand scheme of things of the shooting. So that would be a, a big climax to wrap up the whole story with, uh, right? Uh, no, motherfucker, we are 60 pages into the book. We are one third through this thing. This is not a climax yet. This is largely irrelevant. I have a number of problems with how the school shooting is, is handled. Largely because it is first and foremost pushed for an anti-gun message. Now, I am not about to get political, that's not what my channel's about, but the whole message <clears throat> is, is so fabricated and so forced, again, takes away from any sense of authenticity, especially when you consider this would be one of the worst shootings in human history, and that tops out a few actual battles in, like, wars, because Seth kills 52 students and wounds another four. Now, when you're writing a, a big scene like this, you've got to be careful because, again, this shooting was not earned. We're not that attached to the characters yet, and the characters don't do anything to really change or, or adapt. Uh, Jason's a little cooler because he stopped a mass shooting in progress, uh, so that's awesome, but he's an asshole because he feels up girls later and, and loses all of his cool points. More importantly, James, this shooting does not do anything to really affect him. He kind of uses the tragedy to get a little closer with Abby, which is scummy, but in a larger scheme, just, just looking at the big picture, this moment does not affect him. Now, you can use something like this early on in a story, um, while this would be better saved for a climax where uh, James has to consider his survival versus the survival of his girlfriend, uh, like the one good thing in his life, if this school shooting was like the actual climax, it could have been good. It could have been useful, but it's not. You can use a big scene like this early on to establish who a person is. Michael Grant's Gone, for example, does this extremely well when the main character a 14-year-old named Sam has to charge into a burning building to save a kid's life. And that was that scene in that book was great because it showed character, it showed that Sam stood out from the other kids that were gathered around the building, uh, worried, oh my god, what are we gonna do? Sam at that point is a man of action, he is a hero, and that establishes who he was for much of the rest of the series. By the way, go read Gone. Very good books. This school shooting doesn't do anything for James as a character, and it doesn't do anything for the plot until like the last 15 pages of the book, and by then it's it's basically a footnote. This entire thing was an attempt to push an anti-gun message, and it's so sloppily done. This is the literary equivalent of screaming in an open mall because you want attention. And then there's the terrible way the scene is described. I haven't gone into detail about the actual descriptions that this book offers. Um, calling them minimalistic is doing the book a favor. You get almost no idea of what anything looks like, so you have to substitute it with your own personal experience. And that doesn't do much to bring the world to life. Think about how realistic Hogwarts felt as as you were reading through those pages. How well J.K. Rowling explained everything around you as, as Harry was led into the Great Hall for the first time to sit down with a sorting hat. How the hallways around him were described. That is grade A writing. Actually, I didn't realize this at the time, but as I was reading this, um, I, I unconsciously substituted my elementary school for the setting of this book because I had nothing to build off of. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> throughout the, the shooting, um, 
I wondered very much what kind of gun uh, Seth was, was using. Uh, I'm hardly a gun expert, but I do know a few basics. Uh, Onision clearly doesn't know anything because we don't get any idea of what kind of gun he's even using until several chapters later from this. As Seth points the gun at, uh, at the teacher before Jason jumps him, we get the line, Upon hearing her verbal condemnation without hesitation, Seth whipped his gun toward her like a sword being unsheathed. Time again felt like it had dramatically slowed as his weakened arm struggled to steady his aim. Now, when I first read that, I pictured that, and don't worry, these are airsoft guns. When he said that, I figured he had holstered his gun and had just unsheathed it and dramatically aimed it off screen. Uh, we discovered later on that he was actually using an M16, a military grade automatic rifle, which normal civilians actually can't own. Uh, it could have been an AR-15. That would have been more commercial standard thing. Something, something kind of like this, again, airsoft gun. Um, so, whipping it out like a sword doesn't really work. This doesn't look right. I don't have enough room to really do this. For him to uh, unsheathe this like a sword, I guess he's using it one-handed, which is really unwieldy, because, well, I don't know how much you can see that shaking, but I can barely hold this up. And I haven't been firing an automatic weapon for several minutes, so take that into consideration. The problem with that is Onision's anti-gun rhetoric is pouring through and it's obvious he doesn't know what he's talking about. I, I'm sorry to get semi-political on this. It's just, it's garbage writing and I, I want to go into detail about it. So he doesn't know what he's talking about because he doesn't understand to even get an M16, you've got to have a class three license or prior military experience which tells me that Seth's father, best case scenario, Seth's father uh, has one of these and was irresponsible enough to leave his, his gun out of a safe or somewhere was, uh, where Seth could access it. And Seth was never properly taught uh, gun safety or respect for them, which is a tremendous problem. But instead, Onision chose the M16 because it's a large military gun it sounds scary and it, it uh, evokes a particular image uh, that he wanted to invoke without regards for any kind of logic or narrative cohesion. He's using a big scary gun because he doesn't like them. If you're ever going to write about something you don't like, which the guy has every right to do, it... it Helps if you have the slightest idea of what you're talking about. Anyway, hate guns, love guns, whatever. Do what you want. Just understand the facts. Anyway, after the shooting, some bureaucrat from the uh, President of the United States office comes by and talks to the kids and promises that the President is willing to stop by the school and talk to all of the students individually. And uh, keyword there, individually. Anyway, he goes on a very long anti-gun rant, and uh, the whole assembly that uh, he's a, a guest for culminates in Mr. Mac, the gym teacher, being shown via, I guess, a Skype call, and he's in the hospital with plenty of wounds from the, uh, from the shooting. Uh, that's exactly the kind of thing you want to show a bunch of recently traumatized students. He's banished to hell, he's uh, lying in a bed, hooked up to all sorts of devices. It's, it's, that's not gonna permanently scar the kids. And then Mr. Mac goes on a, uh, an anti-gun rant while he discusses uh, his actions in the, uh, in the fight. Apparently, he managed to punch Seth in the throat or something like that. The, the whole thing is genuinely uninteresting. Mr. Mac is probably the most likable character of this entire book, but compared to what he has to compete against, that's not an accomplishment. Oh, I, I forgot about this, actually. Um, Seth also planted a bunch of explosives around the, uh, the building. Uh, none of them went off, but the, the explosives are also very mishandled because 
At one point, they're described as um, it's described as being like napalm, um, which no, that's not how explosives work. It's true that Seth could have made a bomb in his house. You can actually make uh, small, low-yield explosives out of the materials in your kitchen. And Seth, I, I guess if you read the Anarchist cookbook or something, he would have been able to uh, conjure something up. It would not have been as powerful as napalm, which napalm is an incendiary, which means that it burns. It doesn't really explode. It doesn't have the same pressure wave that a standard uh, bomb would have. And for the record, just so, that was, just so we're clear, it's not the, the flames of the bomb that kills people. It's the pressure wave that the bomb pushes out. Uh, something like C4, I think, pushes out at about 24,000 feet per second. Napalm would just do some damage to the building, depending upon whatever it's made of. We don't know because it's not described. So, uh, apparently, James and Abby talk, and uh, they decide that Abby should move in with James because, remember, the rest of his family is going to the other side of the mountains to live with James's mom's boyfriend, whatever his name was. Uh, but James didn't want to leave because that would mean leaving Abby. So they both have the whole house to themselves, which I guess James's mom is okay with because she's going to be, she's still going to be paying for everything. So like that includes the power and the internet and the food and the property taxes and everything else. It's such an unnecessary cost, especially if the town is really as crappy as it's described to be. So, I don't see any mother, just despite, you know, early teenage love, um, I don't see any mother really doing that when financial hardships are clearly part of the subtext of the characters. But anyway, they decided that it would be a good idea to go talk to Abby's father about her officially moving out. And uh, we, we get this very interesting scene because uh, he starts screaming at her. Keep in mind, he's had, like, no interaction with her since the shooting, but uh, he starts screaming at her, calling her an ungrateful brat. Uh, this, uh, do you think I raised you to show zero respect for me? Is this how I raised you? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, he starts throwing a bunch of rocks and uh, beer bottles at her. And as this is happening, a cop just happens to walk up on the street, apparently while walking his dog, like his his canine partner um, and just stands there he just happens to be in the area which is remarkably lucky and just stands there while all this verbal abuse is going on and the uh, blatant assault with the rocks and the beer bottles the cop doesn't do anything until the dad actually takes a beer bottle and clocks James in the face it's like, what, what kind of an image is this supposed to set? The cop just doesn't care. It's like, oh yeah, you can you can abuse your daughter all you want, but if you touch the main character, you're in trouble, buddy. This is such a fucking ego trip. And I, I really love the way that the cop is described because um, he sicks his dog on the dad and then just kind of hangs back while the dog chews on the dad's arm. Um, it was as if he, the cop, really, Ash? It was as if he enjoyed seeing people who commit unprovoked violence suffer an even greater opposing force as everyone knew it was over the moment the dog latched. Now keep in mind, that conflicts with the very next page to describe the cop when James says, I knew it would be gullible of me to assume he had never seen anything like this. In fact, it was probably a daily occurrence. Everyone gets numb to routine no matter how dramatic or strange. This officer had a look like he had seen this day come and go a hundred times before. So, is he a desensitized cop? Or is he an asshole who gets off on violence? I guess we'll never know, but that's the last we ever see of Abby's father. But the whole thing is, is just more trauma linking uh, James and Abby together. They're, they're both such sensitive, broken people that they're the only ones who can understand each other's pain. Oh, this world is so cruel. Ash, I am gonna clip all your nails as soon as this is done. But the next chapter, the president actually makes good on his promise to stop by and talk to the kids. The thing that's interesting is that despite the fact that there were several, um, several explosive devices found around in this shitty little podunk town, 
where a school shooting, the worst school shooting in the country's history, mind you, has ever occurred. Um, the president walks in with minimal security detail and is apparently going classroom to classroom to visit the, the, visit the kids. The most that we see traveling with him as, as far as security are four members of uh, Secret Service and they don't like do anything. They don't sweep anything. They don't check the kids. Uh, again, in a school where a shooting just happened. See, what should have been done is all the kids would have uh, should have been led to the gym where Secret Service would have been able to sweep the immediate area, uh, confirm that was all safe, and then they could do basic screening on the kids as they're walking in, like just uh, metal detectors would, uh, would probably be enough. But no, I, I guess one of the most protected people on the entire planet can just breeze in and out of whatever classroom he wants to. And oh my god, the president. Uh, one of the kids decides to try to be funny by asking, why are you such a D-bag? And um, the, the president responds with, now you may feel I am what you said, a D-bag, but you should know to address me as President D-bag. So that's right, he's, uh, he's the cool president. Now, the president asks if anyone has any questions. Everyone in class raises their hand. And uh, the president looks directly at James and says, James Patrick, the boy who nearly saved the day. What is your question? How does he know anything about James? And yet, because he's the main character, of course, the president of the United States, one of the most important uh, people on the planet, knows who he is by name. I've read up on this school and the recent events quite a bit. How are your feet healing up? James stepped on glass, but that doesn't make him John McClane. And he, he's not even given a name, it's just the president. It's, if you wanted it to be timeless and not attached to uh, President Obama, who was president when this book was published, that's fine, but at least give him something. Like, President Johnson would be basic, but it's something. This president has no identity, very much like so many other things in this book. Uh, James's question, of course, it's not... If it had been uh, something akin to what are we going to do to prevent further school shootings, I would get it because that would go along with the message that has been pushed thus far. Uh, it would be thematically relevant and it's something that would suggest that the shooting actually had some effect on James as a character. Instead, he asks, I just wanted to know how you feel about the things people call you in the news and around the world. It's such a softball question. You've got the President of the United States willing to answer any question, and you waste it on that. The President's answer isn't much better, uh, by the way. He just says, I cannot and do not want to control what people say about me. All I can really fully control is what I myself am saying and doing. He goes on for like an entire paragraph like that. And then everybody clapped. But despite the promise to speak to each kid individually, the president then just leaves. He promises uh, a bunch of changes and he'll approve a budget shift that will help fund significant renovations and an effective security program that will promote a safer environment for everyone at the school. Um, I didn't know that the president of the United States dealt with issues on such a small level. I, I thought that that would be a county issue, maybe a state issue. It's not a federal issue. And this is a very minor point, but throughout the entirety of the president's visit, uh, Onision never uses the term Secret Service. He just says USSS, which of course is short for United States Secret Service. Uh, the problem is when you're writing something like that, you've got to explain things, at least initially, for all the uninitiated readers. What if this tries to go to a, a foreign audience and they have no idea what the Secret Service is? What if a, a younger person tries reading something like this because they hate themselves and they want to hate reading? They might not know what the USSS is. Abby moves in, some kid unironically uses the term sissy. We got some typos. Got a bunch of typos. Oh, God. So, um, there's this scene when Abby decides that she wants to come out about some past trauma that she has experienced. And this is, this is an example, this is a great scene 
to demonstrate that this is all some bizarre personal fantasy for Anision. Abby decides to have a conversation with James, but she wants to have it in the bathroom while she's taking a shower. Not exactly the most conducive environment for a lengthy, heartfelt uh, confession or any kind of admission of past sins or anything like that. Uh, this is a this is an excuse for Abby to dramatically throw her towel off and reveal all the self-inflicted scars that she has over her body. I, I'm not going to say anything against um, self-harming. It's it's terrible. Uh, no one should do it. Unfortunately, a lot of people do it because it is the only way they know to regain any kind of control in their life. And and. Um, it sucks. I I wish people didn't do it, unfortunately. There's a lot of bad things out there. I'm not even gonna make an emo joke about that. It's it's it sucks. And if Venetian wanted to use this as a moment to flesh out the characters or talk about how um, kids in high school, maybe women in particular, don't feel safe in going to school, um, it could actually be something good. It, it could have been meaningful, it could have been deep, it could have been important. But that's not what this is. Abby takes all of her clothes off so that James has something to ogle at, and then they have sex. And... Oh, you thought the sex scenes in Fifty Shades of Grey were unimpressive. But Onision does not give the topic the, the seriousness that it really deserves. And if he doesn't want to write about that, then that's fine. If he just wants to make a, a quick glance over it because that's not what his story's about, that's fine. The problem is, he's setting up these characters, this, this one broken character, uh, as this damaged, unfortunate, weak woman who is there for James to fix. She's not a strong uh, character, she's not really independent. Quite the opposite, actually. She's so dependent on James for comfort that for a long while, I was worried that she was the victim of sexual abuse growing up. The speed at which she attaches to James and how ready she is to do all these things for him seemed to suggest prior sexual abuse. But none of that matters. Um, this is all part of Anision's personal fantasy. That's that's what he wants uh, in uh, in a woman, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes that happens. Sometimes guys are shitty and they uh, they imagine power fantasies like uh, power fantasies like that. Onision does not talk about any of Abby's trauma or past experiences. He doesn't confront the issue, he covers it up. James just kisses Abby's scars and doesn't talk to her like the adult she needs. I believe that James is the kind of character that everyone on r slash nice guys see themselves as. They're not there to support the women in their lives. They're there to bravely slay the dragons and demons and knaves bothering poor milady. Apologies to Sorrow TV. He does that voice much better than I can. The whole thing just annoys me because this could have been a really good scene and it's just there for personal spank material. I would also like to point out how creepy it is for a man in his 30s to describe two teenagers having sex, um, and I'm not sure that either of them is over 18. Then again, giving his history with underage girls, I don't think Anisian would see a problem with this. Whew, okay, so, uh, enough of that. Uh, moving on, we get more saccharine garbage. Uh, these two just love each other so very, very much. Abby writes James a letter saying, okay, I am damaged, um, but it's not like you think, uh, because she got raped. I'm not gonna go into another rant about this because I'd be repeating the same points that I did uh, just now, but there's a good bit of advice that I got a while back when uh, in regards to writing, and it was, if you can use anything other than rape, don't use rape. Rape is, is one of those really sensitive topics that 
Onision's not prepared to talk about, and it shows, because it's, it's just another uh, stepping stone in his romancing Abby via trauma. Uh, but again, it's not given the respect that it deserves. But it is the reason that uh, Ms. Robertson hates Abby so much, the guidance counselor. Uh, because apparently Seth, um, when he was dating Abby previously, found out that she had gotten pregnant from her rape and proceeded to punch her repeatedly in the stomach. Ms. Robertson apparently despised her because she thought she had gone and gotten an abortion. And uh, that is uh, Anisian's tie-in for uh, being pro-choice. And uh, that's a topic I am not getting into. But Abby says that uh, James is the light of her life and all that stuff. So in response, James walks into the middle of her class and vigorously makes out with her right there in the middle of the room with everyone watching, which I can imagine would be a little upsetting, uh, maybe embarrassing or off-putting for normal people, but uh, neither of these characters are normal, so Abby just rolls with it, and nobody gets in trouble. This is a this is a very realistic book. I am enjoying this book. We then get another sex scene between James and Abby, and uh, James describes himself in such a way that he could only be the greatest lover of all time. <laughs> Who would have thought? Slow starter, then turns out to be a genius in bed. Ladies and gentlemen, James Patrick is a sex god! <gasps> yeah. Anyway, more boring happens. Uh, some of the security updates happen, and we're introduced to the security guards. Like everything else in this book, it's bad. Sir, can you remove all metal items? A man dressed as a security guard said to me. Why didn't she describe him as a security guard? Why, why does it have to be a man dressed as a security guard? Is he imitating a security guard? Is this part of some bizarre cosplay? More meaningless scenes in the school, and uh, it turns out that Jason apparently groped Abby during class. Uh, the teacher did nothing to stop it, because all the teachers in this book are remarkably unprofessional. So James does the only thing that he knows how to do. Now, you remember the uh, note from earlier in the book where uh, conflicts between men are best resolved with the bloodying of their fists and how that was a bad thing? Well, James decides that the only way to confront Jason about um, assaulting his girlfriend is to beat the crap out of him. Now, I don't have a problem with that, frankly. I'm cool with it. It is hypocritical, though, of James. It's It's to go and complain about something like that. And it's not like this is really character growth. If he had started from one position and uh, just evolved over the course of the book, perfectly fine, totally encouraged. Except he has nothing to support this new mindset. He just, nothing slowly changed him to that. He didn't get any alternating worldviews or wise words from an elder or anything like that. It's just, dude, touch my girlfriend, switch, change my mind. So we've got, Four guys uh, standing around in the parking lot, including Jason, and uh, James decides to walk up and apparently takes an outer shirt, wraps it around Jason's neck, and flips Jason over his shoulder. That is actually a lot harder to do than you think. Before anyone can recover, James also kicks one of the jocks in the balls and punches another in the throat. He then stomps on one of the jocks' balls uh, before he could recover. Um, that's not how men fight. And I just gotta say, I love the way that James starts off this fight because he, he says that he approaches a now turned away Jason. I'm not sure Onision has ever read a book before. We then get more detail as uh, Jason and James fight one-on-one, -on -one, going back and forth with um, uh, James ultimately winning because he can just turn on badass mode whenever he wants. He's this poor downtrodden guy that life just likes to shit on but oh, if you make him mad, he'll hurt you. Uh, that fight leads to basically nothing. Uh, nothing becomes of it. Um, Abby's really proud of her man for standing up for her, though. And then James, Abby, and uh, Davis 
go hang out for a little while. They go to a park, and I just, I rather enjoyed this, um, this bit here. Davis found a paperboard sheet stapled to a tree. It was asking for everyone who saw it to sign it, so the person who posted it could come back and take it to their local politicians to have their favorite drugs legalized. Davis found a petition sheet. That was it. That's all you had to say. You don't want to keep going on with your descriptions. You want to shorten it so that the reader doesn't get bored. Vary your sentences. You have too many descriptions that go on for too long. These sentences, some of them just don't fucking end. Uh, but that leads us to the bridge scene where some guy apparently jumps off a bridge and Davis, in an attempt to save his life, runs out into the middle of a highway. Uh, and then he gets hit by a car. And he dies. And it's so tragic. Now, I have avoided talking about Davis because Davis is unique within this world. Davis is this super happy-go-lucky weirdo that uh, James hangs out with for some reason. Uh, James is the center of Davis's world. Frankly, for the longest time, I was working under the assumption that Davis was gay. Davis gets irrationally angry when James and Abby start hanging out more. And I was so sure it was because uh, Davis was secretly in the closet and was jealous because he no longer felt like he could come out and confess his love for James. Uh, no, that's... Turns out that's not the case. Uh, but this dies, and and unlike the school shooting, this actually does have an effect on James, because he, he gets so sad and uh, so angry at himself for, for just being there. Not because he didn't do enough to save Davis, but because if, if Davis had never met him, Davis would still be alive. He wouldn't have been in the car at that moment when the guy jumped off the bridge. Uh, but no, actually, I wanted to take a moment to, to go back and um, talk about some of Davis's lines. And a, a good many of them are marked by these cringe notes that I have here. If you've seen any of Anision's videos, you understand that he has a very... I'll be nice and call it an unconventional sense of humor. He has such lines, uh, such as when they're walking out of a store. On the way out, Davis wasn't done yet, so we turned to everyone in the store and screamed, Hi-ho, silver lady, mammy, poppy, sickle! His antics made no sense, yet still caused me to laugh even harder than I'd had before. Come on, Davis, I screamed as I headed to the parking lot. Okie dokie, Captain Derp, he screamed back. Davis's lines are remarkably unfunny. Like, uh, there was the scene when James was gonna go beat up Jason and his cronies, and, uh, Davis screamed, Oh my god, you're going to beat their booties? Davis does whatever he can to try to cheer James up, and at one point screams, I love you so much, I wish you were my boyfriend. Which, again, was part of the reason why I thought Davis was actually gay. Uh, but he has another line on the same page. So what's up, buddy? How can I turn that frown upside poopy poop poo? That is... That's not even a joke. It's not even a thought. It's just... That feels like a joke that Onision forgot to delete. Like he just put that in his filler and never came back to fix it. That is right there the sum of Davis's character. So when he dies you don't care, because you're not losing anything. Comedy is a great way to get you attached to a character. That, that was one of the reasons why The Flash from Justice League uh, Unlimited was one of my favorite characters. He was a funny, charismatic guy. Davis is not. Davis is so cringy and so unreadable that even though we've got this big funeral scene with Davis's mother crying out that, oh no, her baby is dead. I can't feel any sympathy because Davis is not a good character. Davis isn't even a marginally entertaining character. He's annoying and cringy and awkward. And I, I say this because I know Anision at one point criticized uh, Strange Aeons for mocking Davis's death. 
I'm not commenting anything on any friend that Onision may have at one point known. This is a comment on the character in the book. Davis, as the character in the book, is awful. I know nothing of Onision's friend. I'm not commenting on that. I shouldn't have to say this, but Onision is incapable of receiving criticism. So I wanted to get this out. Anyway, the whole funeral scene happens, and that's, it's, it just goes on. Uh, eventually, uh, James's history teacher and Ms. Robertson approach him and suggest that James become, or James run for school president. And I'm left here wondering why, because James has not demonstrated any leadership skills or social skills. It's just that why do they want him to be the school president? Because he's the main character? That's a lousy reason. They, they don't give any reason why they want him to do it. They just say, we wanted you to run for school president, and this whole TA business was just about figuring out if you're right, uh, if you're the right person for the job. What, what did he do in the TA position? Because we got almost no scenes of that, and the few scenes we do get don't go into detail about what he's doing as a TA. But then it gets even worse because the idea of school president in this in this school is moronic, because uh, apparently. The school presidents in this school have actual power, and they misuse it. They have repeatedly in the past become a complete pain to deal with. We think you're different, and we think you could actually do something good for the entire school instead of just causing a headache for the facility. If they're really that bad, there's no reason the faculty would have no ability to take that power away from them. We're not going to let the students have another election where they have only an idiot and a moron to choose between. One, very professional, good way to talk about your students. Uh, two. I don't think that's going to change with James being involved. And three... Don't you know? It's always between a giant douche and a turd sandwich. Nearly every election since the beginning of time has been between some douche and some turd. But James turns it down because he doesn't want it. And then we get several pages of nothingness until Ms. Robertson approaches... And this is where the book finally does something with the school shooting. It had been a complete non sequitur within the plot up until this point. Uh, but eventually, Ms. Robertson approaches uh, Abby with two police officers in tow. They pull Abby to Ms. Robertson's office for an interrogation. And this is Ms. Robertson at her most unprofessional. The cops clear her, uh, as apparently they've already cleared her beforehand, because apparently... Uh, Abby wrote some letters to Seth saying that she wishes that everyone would disappear. Thoughts that every single student in high school have thought. But Ms. Robertson disliked Abby so much that she wanted it to mean that she was encouraging Seth to shoot up the school. And Ms. Robertson yells at Abby, blaming her for the school shooting from her office where other students can hear her and this leads to rumors going around school. Uh, Abby eventually gets attacked. Some student throws paint on her. The, the whole thing eventually leads to Ms. Robertson being fired, but there's one thing I want to touch on before that. Uh, Abby admits to James what happened and says she wrote this letter wishing that everyone would disappear. She was in a bad place. She was cutting herself. And it's understandable that she would want a bit of isolation. However, rather than obviously understanding the situation uh, or, or relating to it or using the slightest bit of empathy, um, James, his immediate response is to stand up in the middle of her, her talking. Instantly, like a muscle response, I stood up, turning her remaining words into a silent panic, and I walked into the bathroom, slamming the door behind me. Your girlfriend just confessed something deeply hurtful that she feels an untold amount of guilt about, and your initial response, despite everything you've said about her being the love of your life, about her being the one source of happiness, about the support she gave you when Davis died, uh, and about you promising to listen to her and support her for all the good she's done, despite all of that, James pushes her aside and and ignores her for nothing. I mean, he steps back out a few minutes later and goes to support her eventually, 
But you'd think that that's the kind of thing you would instantly recognize, oh, I should support my emotionally fragile girlfriend. She's hurt right now, and she doesn't need me melodramatically acting out and throwing a tantrum like a child. But no, this is just more trauma-reinforced relationship. James realizes his mistake, and he comes out to comfort Abby, and then the two of them are happy. And then the school gets set on fire. Uh, Ms. Robertson apparently got fired for her little outburst at Abby uh, when, the, uh, when the two of them complained. And in response, she set the building on fire. So, yay. School gets let out in, in what I can only describe as the most generous school administration ever. Uh, the students don't need to finish up the semester. They'll just get passing grades and start school next year in the fall because I can't go to the building. It's burned down. Because, you know, that's, that's a great life lesson for the kids. Life is too hard, so here, have, have an easy A. Remember, if your roommate commits suicide in college, you get free A's for the rest of the semester. Uh, true story, when I was in high school, we had so many snow days one year that we actually had to make them up by uh, staying, I think it was 30 minutes late uh, each day in school. Absolutely terrible. I, I would have loved to have an administration like this that was just so flimsily ignoring the rules. <laughs> there are standards they are legally required to meet, and I guess these guys just shrug it all off. Ah, it's too difficult. Why even bother? James, realizing something, a small smirk crossed his lips. Well, I guess this means I won't be running for president. Oh, that's, that's an ending. Especially considering that James had already confessed he had no interest in running for school president, so I don't think that was a question. Uh, th this was um, absolutely mind-bogglingly awful. Uh, the, the characters don't work. The setting is boring and nondescript. The plot is all over the place. There's no real direction for the plot. It just goes wherever it wants to. There's no growth. There's no development. There's no depth. There's very little meaning behind anything. There, there's like minimal themes. Uh, the pacing is atrocious. Scenes drag out or they exist for no reason. The dialogue is cringy as hell. And yet at the same time, I don't regret buying this because I enjoy making fun of stupid books. It's, I'm a masochist. What do you, what do you, I don't know. The people on the internet like it when I hurt myself with bad reading. Now, before I completely wrap this up, I wanted to go over a few more notes that I, I didn't touch on here. And also go over the characters. Let's starting with James. James Patrick is an idealized version of Onision himself. He pretty much admits that on the very first page. So right off the bat, Onision comes out and says, Hi everyone, this is a Gary Stu. He is me. He is perfect. Love him. And although the term Gary Stu, like Mary Stu, gets tossed around a lot, I genuinely, uh, genuinely believe that because James never has to really struggle that much, despite all the, the fights he gets into and the difficulties he has with his family and all that. He never earns anything. He just gets the girl. All the problems just get resolved. The, the bad things that happen around them don't impact them. The school shooting was largely meaningless to James. He doesn't grow. He doesn't learn. He can turn on instant badass mode when he needs to. I, I think that characters should suffer a little bit as the book or the, the series uh, goes on. I don't think James really does. Not in a, not in a real way. More like the kind of whining entitled teenager way. Oh, school is so hard and and I don't have any friends and things like that. It's like, bitch, it's for, that's what everyone says. You're not special. There's nothing that makes him stand out. Uh, James is an outsider and he talks about it regularly, almost as if he finds comfort in it. Um, so he's an intentional loner who hosts pity parties for himself. He's not an appealing character. Abby doesn't feel like she existed before the book started. James had a crush on her from the start and has apparently felt this way for a while. However, Abby never showed any real sign of noticing James until the book started. Once it did, she immediately notices him. 
She just feels unnaturally drawn to James, who at the start is a kid she doesn't know. She constantly flip-flops between being the strong woman that she wants to be and the damaged, broken girl that she clearly is. And you could almost make a, a real character out of that, someone struggling with past trauma and, and make a really good story out of that. But she never has any direction and never really addresses any of the problems, or rather the, the problems she goes through are never addressed properly. They all exist just so James can come up, give her a hug, and then have sex with her. Because that's his reward for being nice. You're nice to a girl, so they instantly owe you sex. That's, that's apparently how it works. That's the lesson Onision is giving his audience. Uh, I think I've said enough about Davis. He is Onision's terrible humor wrapped up in a cringy, crunchy exterior. There's, there's really not much else I can say. Like, everyone, everyone else, with the, with the exception of Mr. Mac, I guess, uh, who's... I guess he's okay, but doesn't really do anything. Uh, there's Ms. Robertson, who exists as um, a, a straw man for the pro-life movement. And again, not taking any stances on that, but she's clearly a straw man. Uh, she hates Abby to an unreasonable degree, and there is not a single drop of professionalism anywhere in this woman's body. Uh, there's Mr. Hansen, the history teacher, who goes from hating everybody to kind of liking James. I'm not sure why. Maybe because James was the TA uh, for Mr. Hansen, but they go, they get like no meaningful interactions to show any kind of growth. Uh, James sneaks out of his TA class to go make out with Abby vigorously, and, and Mr. Hansen gives him the verbal equivalent of a high five. The book as a whole feels like it was written by a teenager who attended a single brief political rally once in their lives. Uh, just a note on the astonishingly unprofessional teachers. This book is written to be a, a serious book. It is supposed to be like kind of a drama, but the teachers are so unreasonably unfair and unprofessional that it doesn't, it can't be read as a drama. Not a good one, anyway. If this were a satire, then, you know, like something out of South Park, then it could work. The teachers are so unreasonably unprofessional that this could only, their, their, their characters could only work as jokes, uh, much like Mr. Garrison, but it's not. You're supposed to take it seriously. Uh, an example of the kind of pacing that this book has, uh, there are two paragraphs, when, when Davis gets hit by the car, there are two paragraphs between when Davis gets uh, interrupted trying to talk to the guy who jumped, and when he gets hit by the car. Uh, this kind of pacing does not give a clear image of what the author intends. The reader is then forced to make up their own mind about what's happening, but then it turns out that that answer is wrong, and they have to go back and reconsider everything they just read. I thought, the way that it was written, I thought uh, Davis uh, was like, was holding the guy in the street. Like trying to comfort, oh, hold on, buddy, we'll get you to the hospital, or something like that. And then he realized, oh no, the guy's dead, I'm holding a corpse. Part of that is because uh, Onision doesn't understand how to write or set a scene, but it's also because Davis gets cut off by using an ellipsis when he should be using a dash. That's how you signify that something's been interrupted as opposed to someone trailing off mid sentence. The scene is very poorly thought out and very difficult. Uh, a very difficult kind of passage to read. This could have been an extremely heart-wrenching dramatic moment as James watches his best friend die, but instead I'm more annoyed at, at bad formatting and prose. Everyone in this town is extremely cynical. James, Abby, and Davis are the only exception, but not completely. Something like that could have been a good setting for pushing a message, uh, something about cynicism or nihilism. The problem is, Anisian is terrible at giving that message. It's almost like the author was trying to instill a sense of nihilism in the reader or to save face from, you know, how bad his high school days were. One, one early point as far as selling books, I mean, you, you can write a book for whatever reason you want as far as I care. And if, if Greg wants to write this book, who has the right to stop him? Nobody, frankly. Um, there is a question that 
one should consider as far as selling a book though, and that is why does this story need to be told? Why should this exist? And I don't think there is a real reason. A lot of this book feels like it was written out of anger, like the author was frustrated and wanted to vent. That could be a perfectly good writing style and frankly can evoke a lot of emotion, but that's not the direction the book actually takes the reader. This book, frankly, does not have a real reason to exist, at least not out for sale. It's cringy, it's badly written, Nothing about it works. Total cancer out of five. It's the lowest rating I've ever given anything. This book was terrible, but I did enjoy it because I enjoy going through uh, awful books like this and um, figuratively tearing them apart because it's just enjoyable for me. And Anusian must have known that I felt like this because he was generous enough to write two other books.